right, ladies and gents, we're back today. Uh, we're going to be talking about Marxism, and we're going to be talking about the environment, ecology, stuff like that. We've got John Bellamy Foster. He is a professor emeritus of sociology at the University of Oregon and editor of the Monthly Review, and he's a hell of a nice guy for coming and being here today. How you doing? Great. It's nice to be here, Chris. Uh, I really appreciate the two topics that you are most interested in. And of course, you've written books called Marx Ecology, The Maternalism of Nature, uh, The Great Financial Crisis, Causes and Consequences. And your latest, I think, is what? The Long Ecological Debt, The Origins of Capitalism and the Crisis of the Modern World. Is that right? Uh, well, my, my last few books are The Return of Nature, uh, uh, capitalism in the Anthropocene and the and um, the dialectics of ecology, which is coming out this year. Ooh, I'll have to have you back for that. You send me a galley. I want to read that one. Um, All right. I, I didn't have an updated list. The last one I had was from 2020. Um, yeah, but nevertheless, fantastic reads. All of them completely interesting. Um, so. How did you get? First of all, how did you? What was your academic journey in becoming in these interested in these two things? Well, that's a that's a long story. But when I was, I uh, you know, I was young. I was very concerned with the environment, um, and um, I won't go into all the details of that. But I was involved in the in the uh, first Earth Day in 1970. And so that was um, a big issue for me. But at the same time, the Vietnam War was going on. I came out of a, a left background, and I was very much involved in the anti-Vietnam uh, War movement and protests. And at the time of the eco um, of the first Earth Day, the um, the focus was on burning rivers and pollution in cities and so on, which was very important. But I couldn't focus on it entirely at that time because uh, we were dropping napalm on children in, in Vietnam. And that took pri priority for me because it was uh, a genuinely human issue. And um, so uh, the, the um, protests against the Vietnam War were, were dominant um, in my mind at that time. And then when the movement died down, I, I got a little pessimistic and depressed, cynical like everybody else, and started reading Nietzsche and Schopenhauer and uh, Kierkegaard, uh, the sickness unto death and all that stuff. And then the coup on Chile in Chile came on came about and which is just 50 years ago now anniversary and um, I got involved in organizing around that and at that time and the economic crisis was occurring too and affecting workers at that time I decided I didn't care whether we were going to you know it, it wasn't matter whether we won or lose you know whether we win or lose um it was uh, a question of the struggle itself, and that I was going to dedicate my life to fighting this system, which is what I ended up doing. So I did that, but my my two primary issues were were the political economy of economic crisis and imperialism for a long time, and and Marxian economic theory. And it wasn't until the um, late 1980s that I came back to the environmental issue in a big way. I came from the Pacific Northwest, which traditionally had a good environment, but I came back here to teach. And, and the Columbia River was the most radioactive river on Earth. People were sitting in trees to, to block um, the... Um, cutting down of the old growth forest at the time of the spotted owl controversy. And meanwhile, we we were learning in a big way about uh, climate change, the, the uh, ozone layer, the, the destruction of the ozone layer and, um, and, and uh, global species extinction. And I decided that all my training in the political economy of capitalism had to be brought to bear on this problem. And that's 
where I went. Um, that became my focus, but uh, and I started writing about the environment. But I became an editor of Month Review um, um, eventually, and and um, I returned to the the uh, political economy of economic crisis and imperialism, which were central there, but brought in the environment as well. So that's that's a brief uh, yeah uh, and, and evolution. And it is all related. I mean, the, the the imperialistic wars that we wage are very much about some of the resources that we strip out of these places as well. So it, it is, mm -hmm. is re interesting related. So when did Marx come into the picture for you and you started to apply that to um, ecological? I'll just go to my first question. How can Marx's ecological critique of capitalism help us understand this current ecological crisis? Um, and how can, how can we apply it? Well, uh, there was this view that Marx was anti-ecological or or some would say he only dealt with ecological problems on the margin and wasn't uh, focused on it in any way. And um, but uh, and I was asked to write an article on the on called Air Day Earth for a German, the historical critical dictionary in, in Germany. Uh, dealing with classical political economists on Mar and Marx. And I delved in, I had a background in, in that, but I delved into um, Marx's relationship to Justice von Liebig, the great German agricultural chemist. And I came to realize that Marx's understanding of um, the ecological crisis, the soil crisis in the 19th century Germany was very sophisticated and that he had extended that throughout um, his analysis. And the, the uh, key concept, which Marx had, had taken on earlier in the 1850s um, uh, from um, under the influence of his friend Roland Daniels, was metabolism. Uh, the metabolism was arose out of the concept arose out of cell biology, but it also became key to the understanding of thermodynamics and the the first law of thermodynamics and and uh, the first s systematic approaches to ecology took uh, metabolism as a, their base as its basis. Um, these these views were all rooted in the concept of metabolism, which has remained, the fundamental uh, base concept in ecological thinking. Marx adopted this uh, concept um, under the influence of Daniels, who was was a, a scientist and a, and uh, and also um, a communist, and who died early. And Marx dedicated the poverty of philosophy to him. But um, uh, Marx read Daniels' mic Microcosmos. And uh, Daniels had written uh, this book, Microcosmos on Metabolism and, and Ecological Systems, what we call ecological systems now. And um, he only had one author because it wasn't published. His only, I mean, he only had one reader. He only had one reader, and that reader was a guy named Karl Marx. And uh, so Marx embraced this, but but the book itself wasn't published until the 1980s, right? But Marx um, adopted uh, uh, the concept of metabolism, and when he when he was dealing with Liebig's uh, analysis, Marx introduced the notion of social metabolism. So um, metabolism really uh, stands for the transfer of energy. Let's say if we're talking about biological. Or, organisms, they draw on energy and matter from the environment and metabolize them in their systems and and um, output them on the other side. And uh, this is all part of the, the transfer of, of energy and, and matter. And it's a fundamental concept in science. Marx uh, introduced the notion of social metabolism. He said production, human production in the broad sense is our, our relation to nature through production is a process of social metabolism. It's an ecological relationship. And essentially the social metabolism, our production system is part of the universal metabolism of nature. It's the specifically human way of relating to, 
to nature as a whole, or what Marx called the universal metabolism of nature. But then he argued that capitalism had created a rift, um, um, that the capitalist social metabolism was alienated and created a rift between, between um, um, you know, a rift in the universal metabolism of nature separating and, and uh, alienating human beings from, from uh, nature and create generating ecological crisis simply you know mainly by robbing nature and not uh, relating to natural systems in terms of reproduction sustainability reciprocity and so on so that became his sort of theory of metabolic rift which i sort of brought out and and then we were able to understand how this went through developed in socialist analysis and ecology um, down to the present day, day. It's really a fundamental perspective within science itself. Um, it's how we understand the earth system metabolism and the rift in the, the um, earth system in anthropogenic rift in the earth system in science. But the, the theoretical basis of this came from Marx originally, and it passed through science. Marx's closest friend, E. Ray Lancaster, was the leading biologist and leading um, ecological thinker in Britain in the generation after Darwin and Huxley. He was Darwin and Huxley's protege. He was a close friend of Marx. And then he passed his notions on to Arthur Tansley, who developed the notion of ecosystem rooted in 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 uh, metabolism and and drawing on Marx's systems theory, uh, and um, that's how a lot of our ecological conceptions developed. But it's crucial because it allows us to understand ecological crisis, how it's related to to a society, how capitalism has, um, in particular, has has created an economic and an ecological crisis that are two sides of the same coin, essentially. And that um, the answer is, is sustainable human development, um, a view that Marx actually articulated. So that's, that's a lot to throw out, but I, um, that's the nutshell. Quite a long time ago as well, to, to, to have the foresight about sustainability that long ago. Uh, but, uh, you know, so you're saying capitalism has no biological characteristics. It's like a cold sort of parasitic computer in, a, in a, what it does for not just human life, but all biological life on Earth. Yeah, you can see this in in um, classical political economy and even in... in um, today's neoclassical economics, nature is treated as a free gift to capital, essentially. All that matters is exchange value, use value, natural material relations don't matter. It's all about the money system. But um, you, you can't actually operate a system like that without destroying the entire environment around you. Yeah. The real shame is that there's all these abstractions on with, used with money that are, you know, you're buying equities or buying speculating on this and stuff. And so there's not even inherent value in money anymore like there might have been even 100 years ago. Um, uh, so how has, I wanted to ask you about your book, The Theory of Monopoly Capitalism, um, and how has the, the sort of the, the monopoly sort of environment or the climate uh, changed since the book was published? Well, I guess there are two parts to the answer. First is, is you know, why I wrote the book. And yeah. when I wrote A Theory of Monopoly Capitalism, the, there was this back to Marx movement in, in, Marx, in Marxism, in, in um, theoretical Marxism, that was very, very important. Um, it was going back to Marx's original text. But in, in the realm of political economy and crisis theory, this led to a, a, a kind of fundamentalism that erased the whole notion that capitalism had, had developed. And then the whole notion that, that, 
that Lenin and I mean, Rudolf Hilferding, even Thorsten Veblen and others had introduced and have been integral to Marx's theory that that there was a, another stage of capitalism, monopoly, the monopoly stage of capitalism, which was different than in, in certain ways from the competitive stage in which Marx had primarily written. And, but they erased that essentially within the fundamentalist Marxism. And they said, we can go back to Marx's capital and it has all the answers, all the explanations. Uh, so you're going back to a hundred years and Marx is completely sufficient in, in his text to explain the present. And, uh, so that was a real problem, and there were polemics against those who had developed the, the theory of monopoly capitalism. So I wrote this book to try to explain how the theory of monopoly capitalism was actually an outgrowth of Marxism, consistent with Marxian value theory and, and all of that, but it brought in the um, a more some of the more sophisticated analyses um, related to to the 20th century conditions that had evolved out of thinkers like uh, Michael Koletsky and Joseph Steinl, especially Paul Baran and Paul Sweezy. So I, um, I was trying to explain, look, we need a political economy of the present, one that focuses on over-accumulation of capital, not the under-accumulation of capital is the problem, that the, the tendency of uh, the rate of profit to fall was 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 um, true for the 19th century, but not not true directly in the same way for the 20th century. That we we had problems of monopoly and overaccumulation and stagnation. So the theory of monopoly capitalism attempted to to bring the the classical debate forward and uh, and uh, in the context of our historical conditions. But um, at the time I was working, uh, you know, I was working with Paul, Paul Sweezy and Harry Magdoff at, at Monthly Review, and they were going a stage further. They were developing an analysis of financialization, because that's where the, the analysis of financialization came from. But this time I wrote my book, that was, was um, understood as an empirical reality, but we didn't have a theoretical explanation for it. So um, the beginnings of um, theoretical explanation only began, really came about with the publication of uh, Magdoff and Sweezy's Stagnation in the Financial Explosion, which was published at the same year as my book. But I didn't, I, I couldn't really get a theoretical grasp on financialization. And we were all still at the early stages, so I left it out of the book. But the financialization has been the main issue. How did economic stagnation arising from the over accumulation of capital under monopoly capitalism, how did, how did that stagnation lead to the, the growth of, of the, the debt economy to uh, financialization? That is the growth of the financial structure relative to, the, to the, what we call the real economy or production. And um, that was the problem of the time, but the theory of monopoly capitalism sort of fell short of addressing that. And I didn't actually address that at all myself because it was such a, a big problem until May 2000, like maybe 14 years later, when I wrote a piece called Working Class Households and the Burden of Debt and using the um, for month review explaining that um, using the survey of consumer finances and explaining that that the debt, the mortgage debt on the working class households was so great and the system was relying on that, that we were going to have a major financial crisis. But then I left that issue behind um, and didn't follow up on it until 2006, when on the 40th anniversary of Monopoly, uh, capital, I wrote a piece called Monopoly Finance Capital, where I explained we were in a new phase of monopoly capitalism, monopoly finance capital, that you had to understand the monopoly and, and, and stagnation aspects on one hand and the finance parts together. 
and uh, this had to be integrated. And uh, that became the basis of our our book, the book I did with Fred Magdoff, the the Great Financial Crisis, which was was published uh, in in two in the beginning of two thousand and nine. Uh, at, you know, we, we had been writing about the financial crisis as it was developing, and we put it all together in this theoretical frame in that book. And then, and then, um, three years later, I did the endless crisis with with Bob McChesney, explaining that the financial crisis, the two thousand eight financial crisis, had brought stagnation back. It meant that financialization could not be the answer to stagnation, but that there was no way out for the system. So we were in an endless crisis. And pretty much that's where we're at. And, um, and, um, and we're just going to keep sp spinning in point. circles until the ship sinks. Um, yes. <laughs> there are two other things that were left out of, of the theory of monopoly capitals, more things that we need that have changed, you know, answer your question. One is the global labor arbitrage which was an analysis that I didn't get into until um, the early 2000s. And uh, basically, uh, the but um, it's, it's sort of dealt with in the theory of monopoly capitalism in the context of Samir Amin. Uh, essentially, multinational corporations shifted production to the global south uh, on the basis of, of the lower unit labor costs in the global south. That the differences in in wages is greater than the differences in productivities, allowing them to to basically um, uh, extract enormous amounts of surplus. What's often called uh, super exploitation or unequal exchange from from the global south, and that became the new basis of the system. While the the North deindustrialized, it placed production controlled mainly by multinational corporations in the South, and then was able to export enormous surplus, which made the overaccumulation problem uh, worse. And then the third thing that's changed is the rise of China. We'll just call it the rise of China. There's a whole. Um, we could talk about the rise of of um, emerging economies more generally, but um, that's altered the uh this the system as well and uh, we've been retracting some of our pol uh, political power abroad it seems like we're pulling out of places and stuff like that and with it we're pulling away our imperialist you know history there and and with it are, are we're going to be facing a crisis as far as you know we haiti makes our t-shirts and china puts makes our electronics and mexico builds our cars are we going to have uh, is capitalism going to collapse pretty soon? I mean, I'm I'm just trying to. I also actually actually I wanted to ask you too. Who what, did Marx anticipate um, regulatory capture? I hadn't thought about it uh, that way. But if you if you look at Marx's Capital, there is some um, one of the big discussions he has is the 10 hour day. So he's dealing with how capitalism has to reform and regulate uh, labor power and and um, in in order to avoid a crisis itself. It had to it had to um, formalize, introduce formal regulations into the management of labor power or the working class at that time would have been destroyed. The family uh, the, was was um, was being destroyed in in parts of Manchester. You had uh, child mortality of fifty percent because the the um, women, the mothers, were in the factories, and uh, there was no way to feed the children. And in those days, and uh, so anyway, you had this enormous crisis, and they introduced uh, the ten-hour day and certain regulations, uh, formal regulations in part of industry, in order to stabilize it. And Marx did a very detailed analysis of those regulations and the limits of them within capitalism. 
So I guess the answer is yes, but not the way we usually think about it. Interesting. Yeah, I think the t term was coined later, but the anticipation, I would assume that, yeah. But of course, he wrote a lot before uh, a lot of these regulations, you know, started. But, um, but as far as the rise in right-wing populism, and especially my arch nemesis, which are the libertarians, um, and authoritarianism, how do we avoid this kind of movement that's happening? And how do what are the prospects for socialist, uh, a socialist alternative, or getting uh, back to our working class sort of proletariat roots? <laughs> that's that's the uh, number one question. Isn't I got it. it. Um, <laughs> I'm asking for a friend. I wrote, I wrote a, a book uh, called Trump in the White House, and that came out was it 2017, and it was it was written, it was completed after Trump's first hundred days. So it was sort of looking at how Trump came in and um, the basis of of um, the regime that was being instituted. But it the focus of the book was actually on on neo fascism, on Trump, um, on on the Trump phenomenon. Uh, being related to neo-fascism. This wasn't about the question about whether Trump himself was a neo-fascist. That was a secondary issue. The the um, the point was that um, that whole Trump phenomenon was related to the growth of neo-fascism. And if you go back to to the rise of fascism in the 1930s, all of the Marxist theorists, you know, whether it was the Communist Party. Um, uh, they, whether it was uh, Leon Trotsky, whether, you know, the independent left and so on, they all agreed that that um, the uh, fascist phenomenon was a class phenomenon, not, a, not primarily an ideological one the way we treat it today, but a class phenomenon. And they all agreed that it was based on the petty bourgeoisie or what we call the lower middle class which goes through various evolutions, but um, has certain, you know, consistent um, elements to it. So Trump in the White House was based on this notion of how the new, how the, the petty bourgeois, the bourgeoisie, or I called it the lower middle class, was being mobilized. It's always the most dangerous element in 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 capitalism is the lower lower middle class because uh, it's the the par the place where nationalism and and uh, and um, racism and um, various um, related doctrines uh, all uh, that, ideology all that good located. stuff yeah, they the lower middle class sees it's is worried about falling into the working class. Sometimes they can be uh, united with the working class or or basically um, um, come to be um, embedded in the working class uh, in in radical periods. but the as a distinct force, the lower middle class is very, very reactionary, very white. And very much opposed to both the the working class and to the upper middle class, which they see as as tied to government and being elitist and professionalist and and they tend to ally themselves with the big capital. And this is the area of small business, it's a lower level corporate management, so on and rural um, sectors. And this is where there's a continuity in this, a class continuity. C. Wright Mills basically in his white collar called it the rear guard of the, of, of the system. So when capitalism is in trouble, it mobilizes the rear guard of the system. Now there's the notion, well, this, we couldn't have fascism or neo-fascism or whatever now because fascism only arises when the left is strong. And the left isn't strong, so the fascism couldn't have arisen. But the the um, fascism actually has arisen uh, very much in context of struggles over global hegemony. And when when a great power is is um, uh, is losing its hegemonic status or struggling for hegemonic status, 
it's going to, um, in one of the great capitalist powers, they're going to turn to this rear guard of the system, this very nationalist racist element uh, to uh, promote their interests um, above all, not to the, the working class, but primarily to the lower middle class. And also, if you look at the system now uh, with this, um, with uh, global monopoly capitalism, it's becoming more and more extremely unequal. Those at the very top, um, you may think that they, they're secure because they have so much power, but they're aware, they're very aware of how uh, shaky their power is. It depends on the rules being, certain rules being followed and um, and there not be um, any um, break with, um, with um, the way in which uh, the corrupt and monopolistic way in which things are structured today. So they need, they feel more and more need for a, um, a rear guard, right, to, to mobilize a force that um, they can count on against the left, against um, uh, genuine democratic popular elements. And um, even, and uh, so um, this is what's happening. And it, it was really signaled by the United States and then, and then um, uh, it's growing everywhere as a, uh, as a result. Now, I mentioned libertarianism. Is there any threat that a libertarian style uprising would happen? And then what would that mean for the free markets? Would, we, would it just be accelerationism? Would we just be buried under uh, a horrible layer of capitalism? Well, libertarians are, are, are really kind of a danger to the system, too, in a way. The, um, because neoliberalism is all about control of the state, um, um, it, re reducing state to the principles of capitalism. And neoliberalism is actually now kind of allied with neo-fascism. There's sort of, there are links now. And, um, and so uh, we have this phenomenon, libertarians are somewhere else, right? They, um, for example, um, uh, some of the, the uh, leading libertarian organizations are very critical now of of uh, U.S. Imperial, imperialism, right? They're very um, which is good. They, uh, yeah, I mean, if you so the U.S. has smashed the WTO, right? We the World Trade Organization because the United States um, has refused to allow any of the the judges who um, who um, make decisions in the World Trade Organization to be reappointed, so that there are now zero judges. So we've completely destroyed the World Trade Organization, but the libertarians are, for example, are attacking um, the Biden administration and the Trump administration for doing that because they actually they actually believe in free enterprise. And what's going on now has nothing whatsoever to do with free enterprise. So I don't think it's the libertarians, it's the neoliberals and the neo-fascists that are really the driving the, um, the driving force yeah driving forces and i have my but I, I tend to skew on the marxist side or the communist side like that but libertarianism has all these uh parts about it where they don't they assume that the consumer is rational always rather than uh susceptible to aggressive or manipulative you know advertisement and stuff like this uh, they're I would say there's some glaring issues with libertarianism over Marxism, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> libertarianism has all sorts of problems. But um, but um, at least they're, they're relatively consistent compared to what's going on now. We have um, the um, – what's happening now is, is – um, an organization of the state on a very monopolistic basis, right? And um, libertarians don't like that. So in some areas, uh, it's interesting because they can be quite critical of the system as it exists, even though they're not critical of the system as a whole. They have these idealistic notions that capitalism really works or could work, which right. is wrong. It feels like they're almost comrades, but they just miss the point just ever, you know, almost there, buddy. You're yeah. almost there. 
Um, and also, how does a libertarian reconcile monopolies? I mean, just they they don't, right? They encourage them. Oh. Yeah, they well, um, they tend to focus on government and ignore the fact that corporations basically rule the world. They treat them as though they're small businesses, like Google is really a small business operating in the free market. Anybody who thinks that um, <laughs> needs needs to <laughs> Stay learn a school. little bit about how the world really works. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad I talked to you because I sometimes I get bombarded by libertarians and I just, I, did, I don't know how they don't see. And, but a lot of them aren't reactionary and I have to give that to them, you know, but... Um, yeah, interesting bunch. So let me ask you another question. Uh, what would a fundamental transformation of society look like uh, in order to achieve ecological sustainability? And how do we do that? How do we build a movement out of it? That's a big question. Well, that's a that's a hard one. Uh, the And it's complex because like all problems in today's world, imperialism runs through through it. Um, we always have to deal with the reality that we're living in an imperialist world system. And often the ways in which you know we struggle, the problems that are posed in the advanced capitalist states are very different than the way um, things are posed um, in the global south. So we have to keep that in mind. But we just did an, an issue of monthly review the um, in in the July August 2023 issue of monthly review is called the uh, plan degrowth um, and um, socialism and and sustainable human development and the the problem is that we have not only climate change to deal with now, but we're crossing multiple planetary boundaries. So the the uh, Earth system or or the planet as a place of human habitation is basically being destroyed, and it's occurring very rapidly. And the the principal problem is is the accumulation of capital and this constant expansion and it's it's not a rational expansion but it's based on wealth and uh, on the promotion of wealth on the promotion of waste and all kinds of irrationalities where we're we're expanding the system but um but people even in the united states are are suffering or being left behind so we have this problem of the accumulation of capital that's placed putting more and more pressure on on the planet and to to accumulate capital they have to uh in this in these circumstances of monopoly capitalism they have to create more and more irrational and wasteful structures uh this is the nature of a society that's rooted in over accumulation so how do we deal with this and uh we we introduce the notion of plan degrowth i mean in the advanced capitalist economies we need what's called degrowth, which is is basically uh, a shift towards a, uh, a um, zero, uh, um, a net, you know, a net zero development. Um, it, it means, uh, it means zero uh, net capital formation needs to occur. And we need to, to uh, reorganize the system according to genuine needs. Uh, redistribute, um, create a more rational structure that and um, reduce the the class inequalities in ways that um, and emphasize, of course, uh, ecological values in ways where we we are able to promote the development of of human development for everyone, so their lives can improve, and at the same time we protect. Pre uh, protect the planet, but we can't do this in an irrational market system that is run on the basis of the accumulation of capital and um, the pursuit of of uh, capital wealth is everything. 
and and nothing else counts. We can't we can't solve our problems that way. We need some kind of planning, and we need to we need to uh, place uh, limits on development. And uh, and uh, re- you know we have to um, at this point in the in the very rich countries we need to have um, zero net investment. Uh, but we need to also to um, improve the lives of everybody in the society. The United States um, has a, an ecological footprint that um, we would, if that is so uh, out of whack with the world, that we would need three or four planets um, to. Um, we would need three or four planets in terms of of uh, the resources. Uh, and in terms of um, climate sinks, if um, all, the whole world lived like the United States, but we have so we have to get our ecological footprint and our energy footprints down. But it isn't um, so extreme. For example, if the the ecological science says that that um, the the average energy footprint that we need in the world in order to stabilize things is the level that exists in Italy today. So the United, you know, living like Italians is not necessarily my idea of like poverty or <laughs> or or um you it, know, sounds like a, it sounds like a step up, so, frankly. Yeah, right. So we need to get the whole world, some some countries, the poorer countries, the countries in the global south, they have to be able to like Haiti, they have to be able to develop um, in order to be able to meet people's needs. Because, and they're not part of the problem. They have to develop, maybe up, you know, be able to have an energy, per capita energy use like Italy. And the United States has to get down to that level. And we have to be rational about this if we're not going to destroy the earth and we have to plan it. And we need a movement that understands this, which, you know, would, would have to be what I call a a movement of an environmental proletariat, which is strongest in the global south and not here, but we need we need a, a new kind of movement that it has to come from the working class in the broadest sense, uh, but it has to be environmental. So we call it the environmental proletariat. We we basically have a an economic view. I mean, a capitalist economic view of the working class. Nowadays, everybody thinks of the working class as basically in the ideology of the system or a very restricted, limited view of the working class. Oh, yeah, they're the the blue collar workers who work in factories and they belong to trade unions and they have this and that ideology. But actually, the working class is a very, very, very broad segment of society. If you look at it in Marxist terms, in terms of relation to the means of production. And the working class isn't just concerned with jobs and wages, they're concerned with their their housing, their their uh, environment, you know, they're concerned with their health conditions. We have to get back to that that broader, more basic view of the working class that um, is implicitly environmental because the environmental it, aspects are really the deepest aspects of materialism of, of, a, of in terms of material conditions. It's the environment um, in the broad sense um, that is most determinant. Yeah, this is not just about uh, policy change. This is going to be a huge cultural shift, and it'll have to start hopefully with the next generation. I see a lot of young people that are starting to get into it now. But um, but look, we've uh, we've run uh, a little over time. Uh, would you come back and do it again sometime? Oh, I'd love to. Uh, I know you have other questions for I, me that I, I, they're just burning I, inside me. Yeah, and I'd love to do it. Um, they're um, these are are crucial issues. I wish I could give you shorter answers, but no, the, the no, answers, you be yourself, the answers are sir. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but you know, there's. I think there's hope. Just to end on that note, that um, a lot of a lot of people uh, seem nowadays to lack hope because they they want you know I want a crystal ball. They look in the crystal ball and they see everything is dark. Right? And there's reasons for that. We've got real crises and 
catastrophes um, uh, before us. But but we um, we already have a situation where hundreds of millions of people are engaged in struggle on these issues at every level. And it's going to move to billions and people are going to be more and more invested in, in saving um, the planet as a place for human habitation, in promoting sustainable human development, in ensuring uh, democracy and equality and, and um, that um, com conditions benefit uh, the population as a whole. The, um, I think the powers that be have enlisted the um, rear guard of the system, the lower middle class, we have to address as well um, because they're desperate because they know that this system can't stand. Changes are taking place all around us. Climate change is itself a change. Nothing is stable. So we have to weave ourselves into this new future. Yeah. And I hope we do. Well, you gave me a little bit of hope. Um, I want to thank John Bellamy Foster, a wonderful human being. Um, also, Turning Point USA's most dangerous man. <laughs> Is that right? Well, one, one of them. <laughs> one of them. Uh, that you, that's how you know he's a he's a wonderful human being. Um, we're going to sign off, and we're, let's talk right after this, okay? All right. Sign off to everybody in TV land. See you next time, folks. Bye-bye.